be facilitated by Phil Frost. So I'll now uh, hand over to Phil and uh, I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Francis. Good evening. Um, as we roll into another four weeks of lockdown, we all look forward longingly at the water and wish and hope that uh, the day we can return freely to the joys of sailing. But in the meantime, what we've decided to do is try and bring you some stories of the worst day and the best day sailing from some of our illustrious sailors in this country. Tonight, we have a new format. Um, it's a bit like speed dating. It'll be fast and furious. Uh, this evening, each speaker will speak for 10 minutes and then we will move on. So within that 10 minutes, we've got to set it up. They've got to tell us about their worst story, their best story, maybe a little wrap up if necessary, and then we move to the next, um, the next speaker. So tonight we have uh, Sean Langman, Vanessa Dudley, Ian McDiamond, Jeff Hill, Karen Gornich, and Jeff Davidson. Three of them are Olympians, four of them hold Baron Joey pins. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Baron Joey pin, the Baron Joey pin is an embodiment of the great traditions and values of those who've competed and continue to compete at the highest level of Australian sailing. Um, it's for those who've represented Australia either at the Olympics, but in Olympic class boats, in world championships, IRYU Women's World Championships or the Olympic Games, um, or achieved a top 10 performance in those classes uh, at the World Championships. Each one has a uniquely numbered pin. And of course, it's named after Baron Joey, which was the boat that um, Bill Northam sailed in the 1964 Olympics when we won our first gold medal in yachting. Okay, first up tonight, we have Sean Langman. Now, Sean, um, he's done it all. He's sailed 18-foot skiffs, 49ers, done 30 Sydney to Hobart yacht races, and the most extreme range of yachts, from the largest yacht in the Sydney Hobart in, in Vestec Loyal, down to the smallest in Maluka, where he's decided to give the high tech of yachting away and go back to the traditional old gaff rigger albeit with some uh, exotic sails. Um, he's made two rec world records set sailing between Sydney and Hobart and Sydney and Auckland in his almost 60 trimaran called Team Australia. It's also fair to say, I think that uh, Sean is addicted to old wooden boats. Um, he just doesn't seem to be able to get rid of them or give them away and is responsible for rescuing many of, you know, beautiful and famous Australian yachts from a watery grave. He runs Noakes Boatyard in um, Berries Bay and he works with young people to give them a trade and let them learn the love of sailing through the Noakes Academy. I think if you look around on the harbour sometimes, you'll find some um, slightly modified Thunderbirds out there with young people sailing them. He's also got the uh, Commandy Pub down in Tasmania, which I've been to and seen some fabulous uh, things down there. In fact, there was an old boat, Sean, that... Um, I used to see on pit water. She was a grey plum stemmed gaff rigger catch, probably, I don't know, about 38 feet with a rudder off the stern. And she was the most beautiful thing and had lovely old couple who used to sail her. And she disappeared. <laughs> anyway, a few years ago, I think it was what, 2017, I was down there for the wooden boat show and uh, John Dicopolis took a bunch of us down to Commandy and there she was up on the hard. Sean had grabbed her and rescued her from a watery grave in Cars Creek. So, Sean, thank you very much. I think there's probably plenty more you could talk about there, but let's get on with the worst day and the best day. Your time starts now. No, well, thank you, Phil, and, and thank you all. Um, you know, going off first in front of this, this bunch is something I don't normally get to do. So anyway, here we go. Um, when we talk about worse, I thought uh, really it's about the most difficult and Thank you for the, the leading there about some of my most favourite boats being the 1932 Maluka and uh, the Orma 60 Trimaran Team Australia. So I'm going to talk about my most difficult day, equal first with both of those boats. And both were at sea, uh, Maluka coming back from Hobart, doing a delivery back to Sydney, where we found ourselves wanting to get into St Helens and uh, the water police sitting on the other side of the bar got on the, the telephone to me on the 
on the mobile phone and said, if you actually get across the bar, Sean, we're going to arrest you. So we didn't get across the bar. I spoke to Roger about him and said, what do you think? And he said, we'll pick up the mooring around the corner and just see the weather out. But we figured we could make it across the strait and got ourselves far west, which was the biggest mistake that I could have made because we ended up just uh, two up. We ended up in extreme conditions. Roger thought we'd see 45 knots and we saw over 70. Uh, so we went through two very um, difficult moments where we broached both ways and rolled her over. Um, fortunately, when she came upright, we had to actually swim to the surface. I thought she'd sunk, but uh, Maluka was fine and we were a little bit beaten up. So we hoped to for the next 24 hours. And I put that up there as equal first to my most difficult day at sea, or worse, if you want to call it that. Uh, the other being on delivery, um, my mate Dave Witt won one of the legs of the round the world yacht race, you might remember the Volvo, unfortunately he won that race into Hong Kong. Uh, so I rang up Witty and said, I think you need a trimaran, mate. And he said, yeah, I need one of those. So he uh, he decided, yes, that was a great idea that he'd buy Team Australia, the Orma 60 trimaran. So part of the deal was I had to deliver that uh, vessel to Subic Bay in the Philippines. So a similar situation, same weather router, um, long suffering, Roger Batham, um, we ran a little bit late on getting out of Sydney and missed the weather window. And I remember being on the sat phone this time, you had to take two sat phones, being at the equator, trying to get a satellite up there is quite difficult. Got Roger on the phone and he said, um, I don't know how I'm gonna get you out of this. You've managed to get yourself in between two converging typhoons. So this time we're going upwind, uh, little Maluka were going downwind. This time we're going upwind and we had to do a bear away in uh, approaching 40 knots of wind. Um, very difficult to reduce sail on these boats. So four up this time, same poor young fellow that we, was with me only six months prior on Maluka on that ill-fated delivery. Uh, so we had to do a bear away and get ourselves back to New Guinea. Um, so in that case, Roger said, uh, the only place you're gonna be safe is New Guinea, we're above the equator now. Um, the wonderful thing about those almost 60 trimarans is you can bang out a 600 mile day. So uh, we did get the bear away in and we did get back. So um, those are right up there with my two most difficult or worst days afloat. Uh, do we roll into best now, Phil? Or? Absolutely, go for your best. <laughs> okay, uh, so best. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about trying to control you, Sean. I mean, uh, trying to shut you up will, might, might be difficult, but you've got plenty to say, so go for it. I'm, I'm not watching the clock, mate, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm watching, I'm watching the, actually, I'm watching the yacht behind you, um, which you're going to give me the name of later. But anyway, look, rolling into, again, equal first, Maluka and Team Australia. The best day on Maluka and after being involved with um, the big Canning Keel boats, push button boats, I decided I wanted to get back to the roots of sailing. Read about the Clark brothers and Maluka. Was fortunate enough to acquire her as a family cruising boat, a bigger version to my little ranger. And with a lot of help, and uh, Macca's on the line there somewhere, a lot of help from various people in the industry, Macca included, uh, we got her to the start line in 2006 and uh, got down to Hobart under five days um, to an absolutely amazing um, standing ovation at two o'clock in the morning, which was fantastic. Uh, so that's right up there um, with my best day um, at sea um, and sailing. And uh, the other one, equal first again, Team Australia. Um, during the GFC and um, that not being the most popular boat to have in Australia, we, we really haven't embraced multi-hull sailing and was finding it difficult uh, for that boat to be accepted here. So set off again, Roger being our weather router and put our 21 days notice into World Sailing Speed Council to attempt to break a world record. Uh, Roger found us a weather window, which was an East Coast low, so another sort of dirty word, I suppose. And we headed off with just a bunch of mates, my son included, uh, from Sydney. And we set a world record Sydney to Hobart 29 hours. Um, no fanfare, no expectation. Uh, but my wife, Kath, had organised a bunch of people and, and won um, the ABC um, television to be there when we, we got there. So again, um, right up there um, with my best day sailing. Well, I hesitate to ask you just what it feels like to go flat out on one of those Orma 60s. 
um, it must be so exhilarating, but probably so terrifying as well at some stages. I, I think the thing is, you don't. It's like sailing only for skiffs, you know, like or, or downhill skiing. I suppose, like you, you don't get time to be terrified, and you enjoy it after after you actually finish the run. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the thing is, on that trip, and those that have spent a long time at sea, I call it when you start seeing bunny rabbits jumping across in front of you that you know it's time to have a rest. And that was pretty much like it is on that trip. Um, you know, it's, it's into the unknown. You know, you sail across various weather patterns. It's totally a surreal experience uh, doing something like that. And for me, um, every day I go sailing I love. So it's difficult to find a bad day. But the, um, the reality of, of my life with boats is that I've been so fortunate to get the opportunity to, to have the extremes. Um, where Maluka and uh, Team Australia have, have presented that for me. So I talked a little bit about your addiction before of picking up old boats and uh, restoring them. Tell us a bit more about that and uh, some of the boats that you've worked on. Well, you know, looking, at, looking around, Phil, the thing is my son's now taking up the reins of uh, yard manager at Noakes. And Pete, my son's going to do incredibly well in this business because he is very money motivated and he's very good at his trade. And he's not going to collect boats. So he's, <laughs> going to do, he's going to do really well. Uh, but the boat that you spoke about that's down in um, Tasmania, the powder blue boat, Chloe. Uh, mm. the, the thing about Chloe, I fell in love with her in McCars Creek, where yep. he, he was uh, when I was a small boy. Uh, we owned Vagrant next to her. and we, My dad used to row twice around um, Vagrant the way in and three times around Chloe and say, wouldn't it be great to have a boat like that? And... Uh, I was fortunate enough to pick her up in 2007, not knowing that she was built by Percy Coverdale of Battery Point Hobart. Um, so it was only when we looked into her history that we found complete Huon Pine construction and, um, and built down in Tasmania. So we've taken her down there for her, her restoration. Uh, now, you know, again, you know, I speak about my dad a bit, he passed away just recently, but, um, but he did say to me when finally um, I got the opportunity to restore mourner that uh, he said to me, he said, son, that's taken you 45 years to get involved with that boat. So, so there you go. Sometimes you've got to be patient. And there's Chloe. How's Chloe now? What, what state is she in? Chloe's in our shed. Um, one of the most amazing shipwrights, Tom Blue, is, uh, works for Noakes down there and uh, he's restoring her. Um, the idea with her is that I'd like to do all the um, Bass Strait Islands and do a really decent time cruising Tasmania. It's such a wonderful place to cruise. Um, again, I've been fortunate to spend time up north with Sundays and Pacific Islands, but uh, Tasmania just takes my breath away. I love it so much. So Chloe's going to be our boat of choice for down there. Sean, thanks a lot. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether enough people know about what you've put in to maintaining the heritage of uh, sailing in Australia, particularly with these old boats. I mean, Mourner for one, what a heritage that is. But um, thanks a lot for being part of this and uh, we'll move on. Thank you. So our next guest is uh, Vanessa Dudley. And Duds is one of our most accomplished uh, sailors. She's started in 18 foot skiffs. She used to skip a Nutramedics in the eighties. She's done 23 Sydney Hobarts, and the best result was a second with the women's team on um, Wild Oats 10. I think that was, what, in 2017, 2006, 2017, possibly? Uh, 19, I think. 19, OK. 19, 19. I'm getting. Um, and as well as that, she's done Transpac, South China Sea Races, other Asian regattas. She sailed with Sid Fisher for five years, and... 100 footers and survived. I mean, that's that's a that's something to uh, takes a few people's breath away, including mine. Um, she's probably the most recognised laser sailor and has won World Laser Grand Masters outright twice: 2013 in Oman and 2016 in Mexico. She always also has an Olympic uh, a Baron Joey pin uh, for the 1978 Laser Worlds. So take it away, Duds, and tell us your best or your worst, and then your best sales? It's hard to follow after Sean. That was great, oh, rubbish. great Come on. to hear your story, Sean. Um, and I've probably got the wrong end of the stick here because I've um, 
I've thought it was best sale, worst sale, but I've actually jumped, uh, I've actually chosen a sale that was my best and my worst, really. Um, I feel like every time I go out on a boat, it's an adventure and you take the, you get to get the good, you get the bad as well. So this was a trip and it's going back a few years as well. Um, and I had to think about whether what goes on tour stays on tour or not, because um, there was a particular moment on this trip that really was my all time worst moment where I really thought that my actions were going to actually um, lead to a fatality. So um, we, we were on a 60 foot yacht and we were training for the round the world race. And um, this particular sail was from Cape Town to Fremantle. And um, I'd done some Hobart races and I'd done Lord Howe races and things like that, but I had, I'd never done anything like a, an ocean crossing like this. And I was probably arrogant enough to think that it wasn't just going to be just like a big Hobart, but it was a completely different experience. Um, and we set off and we only, only a few days into the trip and um, we had a crew injury um, so one of the, the crew sort of rushed forward to help drop the head saw and there was a horrible sound and she came running back holding her forearm and um, she'd probably pretty clearly broken her arm um, but um, we, you know, the medics splintered her up and um, she went down in a bunk and we didn't see her for quite a while and she was one of our, you know, strongest people so um that was pretty disturbing and a pretty low point but we kept on going and then we really got around Cape of Good Hope and then some of the the good the the best sail part came because we had these long days of just sailing downwind in these big long um rolling sort of seas that I haven't experienced anywhere else just um not short sort of sees like you get in the Hobart race, just these great big long rollers and I always love steering boats and um, that was just, it was a 21 day trip and so there was a lot of opportunity to steer a boat and so it was just a fantastic experience from that point of view. But I started to notice um, I, my hands were, um, it was like I was getting electric shocks off the, um, off the steering wheels and I wondered if there was something could they be electrified or something like that I just couldn't work out what it was but I didn't really want to I didn't want to complain it was sort of like a, a training come audition for hopefully for the round the world race and I really really wanted to do that so I kind of um, thought oh, I'll just keep my mouth shut so as the days rolled on my hands kind of got more and more painful and um Anyway, that wasn't the that wasn't the worst bit. The worst bit was coming up because we we ended up um, we had a rig problem, so someone had to go up the rig, and um, so Ross went up the rig, and he was up there for a really long time. And while he was up there, so it, it was a problem with the spreader. So um, he was up there for hours actually, and um, it got dark, and he. Um, he still couldn't fix the problem and the breeze started to die and um, I'd been steering the boat. I think that's the hardest thing, trying to keep a boat under someone in the rig and um, I got really tired. So I went, swapped out, went down below and then by, by then it was really dark um, and the breeze died and so the boat, the, the sails were slatting around and um, then they sort of called for people to come back up into the cockpit and needed to drop the head saw. So I just, um, I was sort of a little bit disoriented. And so I just sort of went, okay, I'll do the, I'll do the, the sheet. Or, I'm sorry, I'll do the halyard on the, the head saw that we we're going to drop. So I just went to one of the, you know, the winches and started undoing this halyard. Anyway. 
I've got it all ready and prepped to go. And then just as I was about to smoke it, someone went, hey, that's Ross. And um, I thought, oh, my God, I'm about to just smoke the halyard that this person up the rig is on and smoke him to his death on the, like, crash down on the... And so I just stopped <laughs> and um, we dealt with, you know, we fortunately I didn't smoke Ross um, and we dealt with, we dropped the sail and everything, but I sat down and I actually, I'd never thought about jelly legs, you know, the saying jelly legs. I actually sat down on the side of the boat and I we could hardly breathe and I turned to jelly. I just thought, oh my God, I almost like potentially killed this guy. <laughs> and um, I don't think I actually broadcast that to anyone because I was still really keen <laughs> to get in the crew to do the around the world race. So, but um, that was kind of my, uh, worst I think that was my worst moment on a boat um we had plenty of days after that to sort of get over that and have some of the best days of my sailing again downwind sailing um but uh and we also had this experience where I don't know if this is best or worst we went part we were sort of just in uh, just a vast ocean. I suppose that's the thing about those trips that I hadn't experienced before. Just no one around, just the whole ocean to, and um, then there was another boat near us. That was the thing. I mean, all of a sudden, this other boat appeared on the radar and radio silence. We couldn't make contact with this boat and um, it was coming in towards us, kept coming in, kept coming in. We were really going fast. We were sort of had a spinnaker up. We were probably doing, you know, high teens, what seemed very fast in those days on a 60 footer. And um, this boat came right into us and spot put a spotlight on us. Um, we couldn't tell what they were. We couldn't make contact with them. And um, then they took off again. So we never really knew who they were. We were near the Kerguelen Islands. So we think that they were French Navy or French, um, of some description, but yeah, it was this mysterious interaction. Otherwise, we didn't really see a boat for many days. And um, anyway, we got to Fremantle. And uh, meanwhile, poor old Joan with the broken arm had started appearing on deck again. But um, she and I went up to the hospital because by then my hands were really, really just electric shocks all the time. And um, so we. I took her up to the hospital and that was a very bad moment for her, probably her worst day because they said, oh, well, yes, it was broken and um, we're going to have to re-break it and set it. And then meanwhile, I thought, well, I, I need to find out about mine. And um, so then just within a couple of days, Joan had hers all in a cast and I actually had my hands all, <laughs> I'd had operations on mine for the um, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome that that trip brought it on so um that was a great adventure for me my first big long ocean crossing incredible highs and lows and then I guess the next leg after that was going on from there to Sydney and um that was where we got dismastered but I I think I'll save that one for the next Zoom meeting. <laughs> Dads that's fantastic thank you for that um, what I find interesting about those things is the whole concept that when you're right out in the middle of the great ocean and you've, you've got nothing around and suddenly the waves, I've not done an ocean crossing like that at all, but suddenly those waves start looking like, or, or the rolling seas just look like rolling countryside and it, it can mess with your head sometimes, but it's, it's beautiful. Anyway, thank you for that. We're going to move on and we're going to go to Macca. Now, Ian McDiamond is another one of our hugely accomplished sailors. Um, he started sailing at Greenwich in MJs and 16 foot skiffs and cherubs. And then he became a sailmaker and uh, ultimately teamed up with, um, um, gosh, who did you team up with? Fletch, with Elvstrom Sails and sailed just about everything on the harbour. And then he met this bloke called Mark Bethwaite and ended up sailing Solings and J24s where they've won 
numerous nationals and world titles. Um, he's done seven Hobarts. He's done the Fastnet, Admiral Cup Series, and he's been a keen, keen competitor against myself and um, uh, Jeff Davidson, actually, on um, Jackie Clare with his boat, Hellraiser. And the Hellraisers are always a, a great team and a great crew, and they're always out in front. But he was awarded a Baron Joey pin for his World Soling Championships in, uh, what was it, 1982. Macca, take it away and tell us about your worst day. Thanks, Bill. I would like to start by commiserating a bit with Vanessa. Firstly, Chris Nicholson at the end of uh, his second last round the world race and he was the main driver on the boat and his carpal tunnel he was in a disastrous state at the end of it he was steering a boat for probably 12 or 14 hours a day and in very difficult conditions and with the shape of the bend of your hands through your wrist that's what does it and I can I can most certainly understand what Vanessa Dudley had um, and the other thing is the jelly legs. I struggled with that one night. I went between the two closest of four headlights on a corner riding my motorbike up to Brisbane. I used to go up there and sail on a weekend and ride back and just do it overnight. A bit younger then, I used to stay awake. I struggle with that now. But uh, I thought I'd just pull up to the side of the road and and just have a rest for a few moments. And my legs just didn't hold a motorbike up and all that just fell over. So I can understand how she felt with that. But I'd like to start with um, the best day. <clears throat> and uh, I probably got an auditor here listening to this tonight in the way of Mark Bethwaite. So I hope um, he'll find my recollection reasonable. Um, Soling Worlds, 1982, and we had, Mark and I had a hell of a lot of damn good days on the water, but this one I thought was just a wee bit in front of some of the others because it was the last race of the Worlds. We had won the Nationals prior to this in Perth, and we won that in the last heat um, by probably a metre, to win that regatta and we're in the worlds. The, um, the race was postponed from the day before because a big front had come through and we were heading off in much, much better conditions. And uh, there were seven general recalls and each of those general recalls, Mark had as well positioned, we're in a good, position on the line and we were turd slow. We were light in crew weight, which was a problem when you're banging head on into the sea. In other words, the breeze had shifted from the predominant um, wave pattern and you were just smashing into a seaway and we just kept slipping out the back door and we try a few things and up for another one. Seven general recalls. On the seventh general recall, I went to adjust a backstay, which I don't normally do. And it's a bit of a reach for me to reach that. I mean, you're hanging over the side, you, your feet are horizontal, your backside's almost in the water. And uh, I went to ease it and it ran through my hand. And before I could stop it, because it, it was good friction rope, you just picked it up and with the shock cord return, um, it would just hold and you had enough grip and it just hit a wave, it ran through my hand. The leech came up rock hard, the sail trebled in depth <coughs> and we just shot out of the pack. And it took me a few minutes or a few moments to try and recover from this disaster, what I thought was a total disaster and we shot out from the pack and we we're suddenly quick. So the eighth start, off we went, much deeper, much harder trim. And instead of maybe having the waves just knocking our bow down all the time, we might have just had the waves under our bow. Making 30. And uh, off we went. And uh, 
We're very conservative. Uh, the person we needed to beat comfortably was Willie Packer, who always being a West Australian started at the pin end and went left, but it didn't always go that way. And because there wasn't going to be a sea breeze, this was the end of a gradient front. Um, and we slugged up the middle, kept our eyes on things, took a few shifts as they went, got to the top mark in second place, only a couple of boat lengths behind an old friend of ours from Port Lincoln, and we'd sailed down there a lot in uh, uh, Ross Haldane. And we got the shoots up and going down the first reach and Ross uh, kept looking astern and said, don't worry about us, just get going. <laughs> we just, we couldn't pass because the reaches are generally not passing lanes. We couldn't pass him. We just wanted to leave the rest astern and just get going. As we hit the wing mark, they made a bit of a mess of that jibe. We jibed inside them, buggered off, won the race, the last race of the worlds and dominated that. And that was one of the, the memorable days on the water, the good days on the water where things seemed to just go nicely. I, I could talk about a lot of others, but uh, that was the good one. And, uh, and that was uh, the second world championship within um, six weeks, maybe two nationals and two worlds. So that was a, a legend crew, a legend crew. So well, they were, give you a bad story. Maka. And the other member of the crew was, uh, was Glenn Reed, who was a, a great guy to sail with. Uh, yeah, now the bad day. I don't remember too many bad ones, but this was a shocker. This was an Okinawa, an Okinawa to Tokai race, and Tokai is near um, uh, north of, um, it's in Japan, obviously, um, north of um, Osaka. And uh, near, that's right, Nagoya, near Nagoya, but on the water, obviously. And uh, it was with a dear old friend of mine, a guy called Yoshi Fukuda, a doctor in Japan. Um, in the crew was a great friend of his, a Mr. Tanaka, Tanaka-san. And he spoke a bit of English. Uh, Fukuda-san, his English was excellent. And for Japanese, he drove a car beautifully. And I, I said to him once, we're going up to the ski fields to a place he had at the foot of... Uh, of Mount Fuji and uh, and I said, you drive beautifully. Uh, he said, a misspent youth. He said, I used to race motor cars, but he drove a car beautifully and he had a fabulous car to, to push along. Um, we had another, uh, obviously uh, his crew on board. We had Sean Kirkjean, who I had ocean raced a lot with and loved racing with Sean. Shane Ganaria, who was the junior. He was the kid who now has my business. And might I say is doing a much better job with it than probably I've ever done or could do. Uh, and myself, so we are the three um, Anglos on board. So we start off Okinawa and I'll be brief with this. Um, and you basically uh, go up the Western or the, the Southwestern side of Okinawa, you pick a slot through a whole pile of, of islands that are on a volcanic chain at the bottom of Japan and uh, then you make your way more north, more northeasterly and get yourself up to the middle of Japan, the main island, basically. And uh, we're in about 20 knots, 25 knots of wind, close reaching once we settle down. And I'd been driving for a while and Sean came up and, and uh, relieved me and I was still on the deck. So he'd only been steering for a few minutes and uh, he just calmly said, I can't steer. And the steering on the starboard wheel, which was the windward side had failed. Um, Shane and I, once we got the boat sort of half sorted, Sean went to the lured wheel. The lured wheel was working, thank God. It was an independent system so that one wheel would work if the other one, the system had failed on that. So Sean was still driving and Shane and I went down to a watertight compartment, opening up sort of hatches, uh, like deck hatches, crawl back there with torches, figured out that we could fix this, but we needed calm water to do so. And Fakuta-san said that 
around the back of an island that was on our lee shore, we could get around there and there was a good spot there and that was correct, he would do so. But it, it took us six hours to get to that spot. But you couldn't go forward in the front we were in because we are heading towards 45 knots of wind and it was going to be blowing dogs off chains and if the second wheel failed, well, you're in a lot of strife. So we elected to be sensible, get back there and do that. As we picked up a mooring, um, I slipped on my, or lost my footing on the, uh, the sort of the seat going into the cockpit and dislocated a shoulder, which actually works out to being a subligation. It was out, but not fully out. And I remember Nick Masterman, who uh, I worked with and bought my first boat from when I was a kid, he had a dodgy shoulder and he said, oh, you just bang it against the mast and whack it back in. So I whacked it against the bulkhead and, and it popped back in, but uh, it wasn't particularly comfortable. Um, and uh, anyway, we got that sorted out. It took us six or so hours to do that. We we're going to then sail back out and join the race and within an hour or so the breeze was dropping we'd missed the front we were a long long way behind the fleet and uh, at about that was just after dark so at about eight o'clock at night we we're talking to the Kuda Sun about this is just going to park by 10 o'clock there was no wind at all and all of us that were traveling home or getting back to work. And this is a 720 mile race. It's, it's a big day at the office. Um, would um, We'd miss our flights home. I, I was going to China to work there for a week or so and it'd be a bloody disaster. And uh, the Kuda Sun said, yep, sure. Let's go into delivery mode, pull the jib down, motor on, let's head north. Because all our clothing, all our gear was at the uh, at uh, Tokai at the end of the race. Um, and about two hours later, and I think uh, Shane, Sean and I had been on deck for about 36 hours plus at that stage, we're knackered. We left it to the delivery crew or, or the, the Japanese guys who sailed the boat down to uh, Okinawa anyway. And uh, uh, I was trying to get some rest in a bunk and, and suddenly I, there was mayhem on deck and uh, um, and we were tacking and the boat had been tacked. It was still at solid rev. So the boat's still doing eight plus knots. It's a 40, 49 footer or something, 47 footer. The boat was still doing solid speed. It attacked, it fell over the rain the night was pitch black overcast light rain from time to time and the area had a lot of current from all different directions you didn't know where it was going and i stuck my head sean was the first up and sean went straight to the wheel and we have what we used to call in our ocean racing a shit fight mode whoever's closest to the wheel between he and i would grab it he was closest he grabbed it and then whoever wasn't would run the deck or do what had to be done. And uh, and I said to Tanaka-san, who was in the hatchway, I said, what's the problem, Tanaka-san? What's the problem? He said, MOB, and in his Japanese language and and my hearing with an, ear, with an engine behind us, I said, what? He said, man overboard. I was like, oh, fuck, excuse me. Um, Shane was just near the nav area, I said, clear them, hit the, the man overboard button, which he did. And then all of the mistakes, the errors and the things that I want to talk about for a moment after this um, took place. And I'll just skip through my notes here a bit and get towards the end. Number one, nothing had been deployed in terms of the man overboard gear. The problem with that was everyone had done their little extra bit and lashed each bit in extra special so they wouldn't lose it. So the poor buggers in the water, the boys were adamant. He went over the side, face down and his light on his jacket lit, but it did not inflate. 
It did not inflate because he flew down um, and you have to undo the self-inflatable gas bottle, otherwise they blow up in the aircraft and he'd probably forgotten to screw them back up. And that in hindsight is what the case was. The second problem was, as we have here these days, is that you have to tell the, the skipper, whoever's running the boat, the owner, that if you have a medical issue, he has to be aware of it. And no one would be better at that than Dr. Fukuda, who owns the boat and uh, is our skipper. Um, he had, in hindsight, he died before he hit the water. And what the boy said was he asked to be relieved from steering. He went to Lourdes, he unclipped his harness. He sort of half sat up from unclipping the harness, went face forward, straight under the rail and straight over the side. Um, the lessons learnt from this, and I want everyone to concentrate. Every, we had, as you have on every ocean racing boat in this country, you, you talk through a man overboard procedure. We did that, we did with young Mitsu, his English is, is pretty good. I don't know how that was translated. Nothing of that man overboard procedure was adhered to. Um, the crew had to be proficient at deploying all the safety gear. Um, from a letter, a, a story I heard from, from uh, um, Tony of the, the, Pace, of the Patrice family, uh, Tony Kirby, when they lost a person, a, a woman overboard, they threw a, a dolphin torch lit and threw it at her. It went straight to the bottom, it sank like a stone. One thing he said in that report was, you need a strobe, not a strobe light, you need a, uh, a high powered light that you plug into the, the power on the boat. I had one on the Hellraiser. The moment I got the Hellraiser and I read that, I put one on the boat. You plug it into a cigarette lighter and you've got a proper torch because those torches in the dark are absolutely useless to try and find someone. Um, this particular ocean race was run with sat phones and not HF radios. We had ships going past us while we we're in a search grid looking for this poor bugger. Um, and they're just steaming past, no lights on, not looking, not trying to do it. Um, and, and I don't think anybody else in that race knew we had a problem. Mind you, we're six hours behind them, it didn't matter. But if we're amongst people to get a message to all those boats on a sat phone to say, hang on, we've got a problem, latitude and longitude, that I don't know how that would work. Maybe these days we've, we've gone to much better equipment, so that might happen. All the Japanese guys, they've got black hair and wear black wet weather gear. Try and find that on a dark night in the water. Make sure you wear something other than black. Um, thank you, thank you for that. I mean, it's it's a it's a horrific story, and I, I can't imagine what it'd be like to be on a boat where that's happened, let alone to uh, try and have to relive that. But there's lessons there for all of us. But we're going to have to move on. Okay. And I will ask um, Jeff Hill to tell us his story about his worst and his best day. Mr. Hill, please. Just unmuting, Frosty. Um, a bit like Sean, I had, uh, in terms of worst days, I had a couple to choose from. Um, in 1983, I got caught in a uh, Gulf Stream storm, um, quite similar to the perfect storm, I thought at the time. Uh, it took us four days to get from um, Montauk to Bermuda. And uh, we had 30, 40 foot seas and we experienced the same thing. I, the only other time I've ever experienced was the 86 Hobart, where you go down the face of a wave and you'd end up with foam covering the boat completely before you then zipped up the other side. Um, 
So that, that certainly was one. Uh, the second one, of course, was the 1986 Hobart, where we foolishly decided not to go on, but to head to Eden. And so did the storm. Um, and we'd be much better off going, going forward, but that's a hindsight. And of course, uh, the one that uh, Gouldy actually mentioned the other day um, was our 2008 um, Rolex uh, China Seas race um, on my TP52 Struth, um, where we lost the keel at about 3 a.m. in the morning on a Saturday morning, um, about uh, 186 miles out of Hong Kong, which is basically slap in the middle of the South China Sea. Um, how that happened was quite interesting. There was a crack which sounded like somebody hitting the side of the, board, the deck with a spanner and nothing happened. And we didn't know what that was. And uh, I was actually downstairs and it woke me up. So I abused whoever it was on deck. About 10 minutes later, there was another crack and the boat started to wobble. Um, we were really lucky. We had uh, Mark Fullerton, who some of you would know, who was on Scandia when she lost her keel. And he instinctively let out the main and instructed uh, Brian Collis, who was on the jib, to let the jib go. And we turned up into the uh, wind. The boat rolled about to about 48 degrees, we reckon. And we subsequently discerned, discovered that the no return percentage was 50%. So we were pretty lucky. Um, some of you uh, would have sailed with Grimesy. Um, he's got the habit of sailing in a plastic bag as his wet weather gear and thongs as his, uh, as his sea boots. And Grimesy being Grimesy immediately decided to dive over the side to see what the problem was. And he came back up and he said, there's no keel. And we said, don't be bloody stupid. Go back and have another look. So he did. He then swung, swam from one side of the boat to the other. And yes, we had no keel. So what we did then, um, very gingerly, um, we dropped all the sails, of course. We dropped the boom. We put water in the uh, tanks because we were racing, so there was no water in the uh, water tanks. And we then gingerly started going back to um, Hong Kong. I was uh, delivering a couple of sat phones to uh, another boat in Subic Bay, which is the finish point for the Rolex China Seas. And the first one didn't work, which was a little bit dismaying. And of course, once you've lost your keel, you only have line of sight for radio. You can forget HF and VHF if you're not if you if you're uh, earth to the keel. Um, so we didn't really have radio receptions. I got on the uh, sat phone, and we got on to Alex Johnson, who's a sailing manager for the yacht club there. Um, and he then started ringing around people, and um, that was the only way we could communicate for a while. One of the funny things was, as soon as we got on the sat phone, um, we were in Philippine waters. Uh, so we, um, there was an emergency number for the Philippines Coast Guard. So we rang that, uh, and what we got was a message, hello, this is, uh, the office is now shut. Uh, we're open nine to five, Monday to Friday, which wasn't particularly helpful for us at that stage. But the Yacht Club was really good, and the Hong Kong government uh, were also very good. And they shadowed us um, back to Hong Kong. We were saved by uh, another boat who we saw the next morning. We set up a flare, they came over and they escorted us back. I think we still hold the world record for TP52 sailing around the place without a keel, 186 miles back to Hong Kong. Couple of lessons out of that. Um, if you're down below, you probably won't get out if you've had all the sails stacked um, in the companion way. Um, and secondly, you really do need to have people who understand and had experience. Gouldy, of course, was on board. So, of course, given his expertise, we put him in charge of the life rafts. Um, we basically sat on deck, ready to get into the life rafts if anything happened. But we got back to Hong Kong. Um, and the most dangerous place was about 40 miles out of Hong Kong when the tanker wakes uh, would go by as the big ships went by. The Yacht Club in Hong Kong was really good. They came out and uh, came alongside and helped us on. But there's, uh, that was certainly uh, rank as my uh, worst experience, Frosty. Um, similarly, on the, um, on, on the best thing that's happened for me, uh, that I, with Duds, uh, I was on Ragamuffin when we did the Transpac race. 
and I'll never forget going down the Molokai Channel towards uh, uh, Hawaii and uh, Honolulu, and we were hitting 32 knots. We were going so fast that the chase boats and the press boats couldn't keep up with us. Um, and that was certainly a, a great experience. The second one was 2006 uh, with Lindsay May when uh, on Love and War, we uh, won the Sydney to Hobart. Um, and that was a great thrill and a very great, a very good piece of navigation by Lindsay. We managed to pick up, jag a, uh, a bit of the, of the East Coast current. And uh, the old boat was doing 11 knots when it uh, should have only ever done more, not more than nine. But the most, uh, the best race I ever had was in 2016, um, when we did the Darwin to Ambon race on Antipodes, my Santa Cruz 72. The Darwin to Ambon race is roughly 640 miles. Um, and it's one of the best hot water races that you can do in Asia, in my experience. Um, it started off very slowly. Uh, it's a real pain in the bum getting out of uh, Darwin. And there's lots of tide, as you would know, lots of current and very little breeze. But once you get out and around the corner, which is about 80 miles, then you hit the trades. And we, um, we had two and a half days of our best sailing. The boat uh, was doing 17 to 18 knots. Um, in very good conditions. We had a, an interesting crew, some of uh, you would know. We had uh, Paul Hayes, Richard Hudson, Matt Pierce, and Larry Jamison. And we all, ran, we all had fantastic sailing experience. The boat was planing, not quite, I must say, Santa Cruz 72s don't plane, but we were averaging 17 to 18 knots, which is pretty good for that old boat. Um, we did this 600 mile, 640 miles in about 52 hours, average of 12 knots. Um, and we beat the previous race record, which had been held by a catamaran by uh, over 12 hours. Um, so that was fantastic. Great experience coming into Ambon Harbour. Ambon's got a lot of Australian history for those who are history buffs. Uh, the Japanese massacred a couple of hundred Australians at Ambon Airport, and one of the worst prisoner of war camps was in Ambon. But the people in Ambon were fantastic, and we just managed to luck it. We, land, we, end, we finished on Independence Day, where they, it was party day. Um, I have to tell you, it's a, it was an amazing uh, evening. Most of us won't remember it. There was more, the beer was about 10 cents a bottle, so you can imagine what happened. But uh, Darwin to Ambon was certainly my best race. Well, thanks for that, Jeff. Um, I must say that um, I thought sailing on uh, Antipodes in Antigua was great fun. Uh, that boat gets up and moves when it uh, needs to. Um, next up, we've got Karen Gornich. Now, Karen's another one of our Olympians and she's also club captain and is therefore the first female flag officer of the, of the squadron. Karen's represented Australia at three Olympics, not in, uh, in the 470s in uh, Korea, 1988. Um, Inglings in Athens and also in um, Qingdao in, in the Beijing Olympics in 2008. She's another holder of the Baron Joey pin and you don't get to be a flag officer at the squatty without being intimately engaged in what the club's doing and I know Karen's in, involved very very much in the LOTS program and, and helping people learn to sail and, and get out there and gain their confidence. So Karen tell us about your worst day and your best day sailing. Welcome. Thanks, Phil. Well, I, I did think I should have a bit of an Olympic theme, um, given that, you know, we've had a week of watching the sailing on TV. And I would never have thought that given your background you know, there. Being able to, to see um, the sailing. And, and yes, today's Green and Gold Day. The AOC wants us to get behind our athletes and uh, dress up in green and gold. And um, uh, because, you know, the, it's such a different environment up there. In fact, today, I think they're having the first um, oh, welcome home concert. So we've got some athletes already at home that have been up in Japan that are in quarantine and they're putting on um, some sort of artists for them tonight um, to try and uh, help them get through quarantine. But anyway, um, I'm going to start off with uh, my worst day. And, um, you know, and I suppose this has come around too 
watching the sailing this week and being in a WhatsApp group where people are going, uh, shouldn't happen at this level, shouldn't happen at this level. So when we were sailing in Athens, it was absolutely spectacular. I'm not sure if you can see all that detail there, but you know, we're on a race course and you know, you look up and there's the Acropolis and you really have to pinch yourself and go, wow. Um, we actually had cameras on board in Athens. Um, you know, the, not much of the footage really up until this Olympics has, has got um, out to spectators back at home who want to watch. And, uh, you know, we had something the size of a, a football at the back of the boat. Uh, we had helicopters overhead. There was nothing like, you know, drones weren't around then. And um, there were lots of media boats on the course. And going into the sixth race, we weren't very happy with where we were. We were just outside the top 10, but the Meltini had kicked in. So there was a bit of breeze and, um, you know, we were really loving it. And um, unfortunately, you know, we were pushing the boat and the England's got a really little rudder on it. And um, probably, yes, my most embarrassing sailing moment. Um, and one of the worst is uh, wiping out on international television. You know, the Olympics is, uh, at the time they talked about a, a worldwide audience of 3.5 billion. Um, you know, and they watched us in this race wipe out, fill the boat up with um, water and, you know, they don't sink because they've obviously got buoyancy in them. Uh, but then one of the toughest things that we then had to do was was continue the race. You know, we, I had to talk really hard to, to get everybody to say, look, you know, finishing last is better than getting an extra point for um, a DNF. And uh, so we kind of battled it out and um, we did finish. And um, unfortunately that footage went around the world. I had contact that night from Rellos in Canada. I had email, I had correspondence from uh, people back in Australia uh, all questioning, you know, was that you that wiped out? And, um, you know, some people would say shouldn't happen at that level. Um, but as we've seen this week too, um, you know, it, it just does sometimes. Um, and I'm going to move on to my best sailing. And, you know, there's so many, I've had so many opportunities. I've traveled and sailed in so many wonderful places with, with um, a lot of amazing people. Um, but I think you're only as good as your last sale. And my last event that I did, which actually was in my J70, was down on the Mornington Peninsula. And if you ever get a chance to go and sail out of Blair Gary Yacht Squadron, wonderful place to go sailing. We had some fantastic, really close uh, competition. There were, um, you know, a number of boats, eight or nine boats from Sydney traveled down to the fleet that's growing down in uh, Victoria. And we had some fantastic racing and, um, you know, that at the moment sticking up there as uh, my best, best day out on the water. Well, there must have been other really good days, Karen. I mean, you don't get to sail at your level and represent Australia three times without winning a lot of races. What was the tightest win that you can remember? Oh, um, uh, yes. I mean, there have been so many opportunities. Um, you know, I actually was part of the team that won the um, Nations Cup, uh, a world match racing uh, event. Uh, we did that, oh, geez, mid-90s. You know, that was spectacular. Um, certainly with the, uh, you know, in the Olympic in the Inglings, um, it, leading into China, we had some amazing results, um, some very close results. Uh, finally, leading into those games, you know, we had the opportunity to prepare the boat as much as, as we could. We really did feel we'd left no stone unturned. Um, with the sail development, the boat development, and, and our crews, you know, having, I think at the time we had three boats that were moving around the world, one that commuted between Sydney and China, one that commuted between China and Europe, and the other one that commuted between Europe and North America, just so that we could be competing as much as we had. And, and you know, I reflect on, on what our sailors have been doing um, leading into Tokyo, where all, all of the Australians have had to really be at home for the last 12 to um, 14 months. You know, they haven't been able to go 
overseas and, and do that lead up. And so, um, you know, that's why it's great to see them really pulling some good it's results. Nice. Okay. It, I mean, it, it must also, I know you're involved in um, doing a, a lot with the LOTS program, seeing people start to get confidence in sailing. That must bring a lot of joy to your heart. I know my, my daughter, Annabelle, was also part of the LOTS program early on and, and teaching people and seeing their confidence grow is, is, is an enormous uh, reward, particularly it mightn't be into Olympic class yachting, but it's the sort of thing that supports the whole sailing fraternity over time. Mm. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. It is rewarding um, watching the penny drop and watching people's... Uh, yeah, confidence on the boat grow and, and I think our Wednesday mornings on the harbour are one of the best kept secrets. We have it all to ourselves. It's wonderful. So um, those of you out there that want to come and join us, we'd love to see you. Okay, Karen, thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on and we're going to have Jeff Davidson next. Now, um, declaration of interest. Uh, Jeff's my skipper. I've sailed with him in... Um, Division One at the Squatty for the last few years. Jeff, um, I, I also first met Jeff when I was 15 up at the Lake Macquarie at the Combined High Schools Regatta, and it's been a, a relationship that's given and taken um, ever since. Anyway, Jeff cut his teeth on Manly Juniors, Cherubs, Javelins, before taking on the Finn class and winning Olympic selection for the 1980 Olympics. Um, his race etchels. He's been part of 12 Metre America's Cup campaigns. And, you know, I'm proud to say as well that amongst the other Division I wins we've had was last season's Division I in the far 37.7 Jackie Clare. He's a past president of Yachting New South Wales and a vice president of the Australian Yachting Council. And he's also a holder of an Olympic pin for Olympic selection. Dave, tell us your stories. Rusty, I've known you since... We were 15, and you know how I hate coming last. How come I'm coming last? <laughs> best, best day, worst day. Well, we have some fantastic days sailing with our friends in the tropics and in Greece and in Tonga and uh, Tahiti. Um, but being a competitive sailor, best day's got to be a race, but I'll come to that shortly. Worst day... Um, you know, they say a day sailing's better, any day sailing's better than a day in the office. Well, that's not true. Um, and I'll go back, because I can't remember bad, I try and forget bad days these days, but go back to early days when I was 15 or 16 and, and we'd uh, just finished the Yachting World Diamond State Championships at Lake Macquarie. And, and you know, Yachting World Diamonds, because you built one in high school. And basically, there are 30, for those who don't know, there are 30 foot long hard chine plywood boat with an open cockpit. Double chine. Racing boat. Jack Holt is on. So uh, we decided that after, as soon as the last race of the state championships at Lake Macquarie, um, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd take the good sales off made by this young bloke, Huey Trahan, who looked like he had some promise. And we put the old Laurie Mitchell sails on. Uh, we, we prepared for the ocean trip by going ashore and getting another few cans of beer and some sandwiches. Uh, took off um, with the outboard motor on the back through the Swansea Bridge. No, didn't look at the forecast. Um, you know, we we're just a couple of young gung-ho blokes on board. Uh, and in charge was a bloke called Ian Peden, who was just a Bandwidth from Clontarf must be uh, challenged here. Dave, you seem to have frozen. Sydney at about, I don't know, six o'clock at night. And Ian steered till about 11. And then he went and had a sleep when I steered. And about one o'clock in the morning, we get hit by a clear air southerly, about 25 knots. Well, that's not a problem. We just go faster. No thought of taking down the jib or anything like that, you know. Um, so just, yeah, here we go, send it. So we took off and uh, the seas got bigger and it got windier. And all of a sudden we speared off the top of a wave and there's that 
deathly silence where the boat's not in contact with the water until it crashes into the trough. And as we crashed in the trough, the mast fell over the side. We thought, oh, that's not a good thing to happen. So uh, we had all the safety gear, of course. Um, no, didn't have bolt cutters. No, didn't have a hacksaw. Had to go around and undo all the rigging screws with a torch, no lifelines. No, I don't think we even have life jackets, actually. That's how stupid we were. No radio. We did have one flare. Anyway, we managed to get the mast off and, and we saw an 80 miler, one of those coastal freighters that was coming, coming south. We could see it's uh, nav light. So we thought this would be a good time to let the flare off. We actually didn't know how to let the flare off. So I'm holding the torch and Ian's reading the instructions with his hand on the string and all of a sudden it goes off. So I thought, well, that, yeah. and they don't stay up very long when you really need them. So we thought, oh, well, <clears throat> we're, we're not looking too good here. By this stage, we're half full of water because we were laying side onto the, to the seas and the, the water's just dropping into the cockpit. So between bailing and that, and that sort of thing, then we thought, well, we better get the outboard motor back on this bracket at the stern. So we tie it to the main sheet and Ian crawls out to the back, no lifelines, manages to get it on the bracket. Hooray, it starts, but we're half full of water. So no better the bailer than a frightened boy with a two gallon bucket. I'm moving enormous amounts of water. We try to go to windward and the outboard motor just half the time sitting in, in midair. So, well, that, that's not gonna work. So we thought, oh, well, we'll turn around and run back to Lake Macquarie. By this stage, we're about five miles off Cape Three Point. So we've not a lot of help around there. So we take off and as soon as we turn north, with the sea, all the water runs to the front of the boat. And we just roar off with this massive bow wave. And we thought, oh, that's, that's, this is gonna be exciting. And mind you, I'm 15 and a half years old. I am petrified. I think I'm not gonna make it to 16 if, unless we're pretty lucky. And then we see this light right out to the, our right hand side, right out to the east. And I said to Ian, what's that? And he said, oh, that's Nora ahead. We've got to go the other side. Of that. We've got to go out to the east of that. I thought, oh, crikey, that, that, that's going to be exciting. And I'm vision, I've got visions of us rolling up the beach or stacking into the rocks. And I just keep bailing. We're tied together through the main sheet and the main sheet block. We just get around North Head because Ian, being a boat builder, he used to build a lot of surf boats and he was a sweep at DY Surf Club. So he was really good at getting this 30 foot boat onto a sea and then we just cut right every time. As we went around Nora Head, fuel was getting pretty low. Um, and then as we got around Moon Island, uh, coming into Lake Macquarie, it was really low. So once we got there, we knew uh, we were okay. Uh, we went through the Swansea Bridge, didn't need to, it didn't need to open because we didn't have the mast. And then, and then we had to find a phone box to ring up the water police because we'd let the flare off. And they said, oh, I'm glad you called. Cool. We're just about to go out and have a look for you because there was no way we were going out there last night. Well, that's, that's great, you know. So this is, uh, we get back to Lake Macquarie and as we come into Lake Macquarie, we run out of fuel. So we only just made it and uh, we, uh, we slept and then I got a lift home and, and like a good 15 year old, I come home and my mother says, oh, you know, how was the sailing on the weekend? And like a normal 15 year old, I said, good, one word. And they didn't, my parents didn't know until about a week later when Peter Green got in their ear and told them how irresponsible I was to go out there. And he was right. You know, now I'm, I'm a really experienced sailor, um, which means I've made all the mistakes you can possibly make in your life. And uh, fortunately I've remembered most of them. So I try not to repeat them. But there was a lot of lessons I learned then, respect for the sea, being properly prepared, check the weather forecast, have the right safety equipment and know how to use it. But um, best day, and I'm conscious of time. Uh, as I said, you know, sailing around the tropics with your wife and, and your friends, it's fantastic. 
racing in Hamilton Island with all your, your wife and your friends, that's fantastic as well. But being a competitive sailor, you know, the best day that I can remember now was uh, sailing javelins with Janine Wilmot. And uh, we won the trials to go to the South Pacific Championships in Fiji. And uh, we won the invitation race, we won the first race. And I think it was the third race, we were right up there, we were winning the series. And we're on the win and the top of the mast fell off. It just snapped at the, at the sheave where the spinning head comes out. So yeah. we got two races that day, we didn't have a spare. So we get towed in and um, I managed to fashion a sleeve out of a spare spinnaker pole we had. Our mast was aluminium, but the, the spinnaker pole was timber. And I was able to drive that down, plane bits off, and then drive the top of the mast on connected rigging. And we made the second race of the day. And we, we weren't as quick because the mast was sort of hinging and we were losing leech tension. But we put in a consistent series and um, all week we were trying to find aluminium to sleeve over the top of the joint. And we had the guy who ran the shipyard and uh, we couldn't find aluminium in Fiji anyway. So anyway, the, the last day, uh, the night before the last day, we we're in pretty good shape. So we're thinking, uh, you know, we've got to come better than third. The guy who's winning has got to come worse and 17th or worse and the New Zealand has got to come uh, better than third. But we, we, we weren't as quick as we used to be. We were really quick downwind because we were light marginal planing conditions and we used to smoke downwind. But anyway, the morning of the first race, we wake up, the last race, we wake up, sun shining, weather's just perfect for us, marginal planing conditions. And as we go down to the boat yard, I walked past one of the also ran boats and I noticed his boom was sort of about a foot too long that he didn't need. It was just aluminium that he didn't need. <laughs> so I suggested that his boat would be faster if we cut that bit off. So we cut, got a hacksaw, cut that bit off, split it and made a sleeve over the top of the mast or a bandage and riveted it on. And suddenly we were a bit quicker. So we go out there and we're confident enough that we sailed the Victorian guy down to the 20s. <coughs> and halfway through the race, we take off and go for it. Coming to the finish, we're fourth. We've got to be third. And uh, right on the line, we get a little shift. We tack right on the line. I'm out on the wire, but I'm not hooked up. And we just snip third. So, well. We've done what we've got to do. And so we, we stop there and we wait and we count the boats over. New Zealand, he's, he's out of it. The guy from Victoria had to be 17th or worst. We counted the boats. He was 17th. So we won the series by 0.3 of a point. Um, the reason this was the best day was was as our first international win. I was sailing with Janine Wilmont, now Huey Trahan's wife. She was the only female skipper or participant in the whole regatta. And we're racing against these big New Zealand farmers with hairy arms, and, you know, wrestling sheep all week. Um, we were sailing a boat that was designed by Bob Miller and Jamie Wilmot and myself built it. And uh, the victory was sweet because we sort of triumphed against a few, quite a few things that were against us. And, uh, I can remember that day as, as, as clear as it was yesterday, but I'm having trouble remembering that last race that we won, Frosty. Well, that, that last race we did for this series, uh, for the season, was, uh, was a classic. I think we snatched victory from the jaws of defeat when the subtlety came in as we were going around Shark Island and took us all the way down to the uh, line when everybody else was stopped. So uh, that was a good day too. Yeah, you uh, only have, you only have to be in. You only have to be in front at the finish. That's it. <laughs> thank you for your time. And look, everyone, thank you for uh, continuing to support um, the Zoom Room. Um, we're going to think about continuing to do this format with a range of different speakers, and uh, we'll see what we can do in the future. 
So look forward to seeing you in the future and um, enjoy your home detention. Good night. Cheers, Foster.